All right, we're now live. Okay, thank you, Jeff, and good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to what is the final session of the day. Um, I am keenly aware that far away time zones have many of you joining us at a late hour, so we really appreciate you being here with us today. My name is Holly Campo, and I'm an assistant professor here at the University of Alberta and a faculty member of the CCR. And I am so happy to be chairing this session today entitled The Other Insiders, Correctional Officers in Prison. Now we are joined by Dr. Talisa Carter from American University, Dr. Rosemary Richardelli at Memorial University and William Schultz, a graduate student at the University of Alberta. And as we've been doing throughout the day, we will go in order of the program and each presenter will have 20 minutes. And to our audience, please, please type your questions into the YouTube chat function and our diligent grad students, L'Oreal and Jake, will forward these to me along the way. Okay, so without further ado, let's turn it over to Dr. Carter. Amazing, so sharing screen, here we are. So I am incredibly excited to kick off this final session today and share with you guys some research I'm really excited about entitled um, Color on the Front Line, Exploring Race, Skin Tone and the Desirability of Working in Corrections. And a full disclosure plug, I used to be a corrections officer in Savannah, Georgia before I took the academic route and started on the path to the academy. Um, but it's really important that we understand corrections. And we know this, you're here, you know this, right? But more than just who's being experiencing prison, who's experiencing incarceration, but the people, the keepers of the kept, right? The supervisors, that's super important for a range of reasons. And so today we're gonna bring up identity, right? Not only what they do, but who correctional officers are is incredibly important and why, right? Why is this important? It's important because there's been a call for change among law enforcement and it's been driven by two themes. The first being diversify. We need to diversify these professions and we need to educate them. Okay? And so it's common across law enforcement. We've seen this that regardless of this slow moving change, right? I'm a black woman. I used to be a CEO, but the change is slow moving, right? Because these professions have remained majority white and majority male, right? In fact, the Bureau of Justice Statistics says that just last month in October 2020 in the United States, 72% of correctional officers were male and 62% were white. And we know that there is disproportionate contact of black, brown, disadvantaged, marginalized, and oppressed bodies moving through the system. And so we know, in fact, that it's not just right um, the people that are being processed that, sh that should be diverse, but the people that are processing right, also need to reflect. And we know that for a couple of reasons. That during summer 2020, right, we just lived through the world responding to racial injustice in the system. And so there are implications of criminal justice employees, correctional officers, police officers, et cetera, not reflecting the populations that they're serving. And now the call to educate. And so that's another big push that, for example, defunding the police. It's not necessarily defunding, it's giving people knowledge and skills to do their jobs in a way that will lead to equitable outcomes. So what does this look like, Dr. Carter? Well, what it looks like, right, is training, right? What kind of training? Training for implicit bias, training for intercultural competence, right? Training for right better interpersonal communication skills so you can work with people that don't look like you, pray like you, think like you, right? So that's what training looks like, but also in specialty areas. So how do you interact with a population that has mentally mental health issues? How do you interact with a popu population in conditions of confinement for people that have ability issues? Right? All of this is relevant and it's not just relevant for retention, right? So we know in corrections that attrition rates are horrible because no one wants to be in jail, no matter what kind of uniform you have on, right? So it's not just for retention, but it's also for recruitment. There are calls to better educate and diversify to pull people from different walks of life, right? And from college, right? That have college degrees into law enforcement. So because now we know that identity matters, we know that. So the conversation needs to shift into what exactly is drawing people into these professions. 
So let's see what the literature says. We know that the literature says that for policing, well, people want to be cops to help people, right? That's number one. That's across studies, right? Regardless of your race or sex, help people always comes in the top three. You're becoming a cop to help people. For job security, job benefits, those come up too. But we know that there are slight differences, right? So for example, in terms of male and female, the motivations can change, the order of things, how people rate things can change. We know race and ethnicity, there's some differences there, right? So even though everybody wants to help um, people when they become cops, white people who want to become cops, that is actually less. They, they're less likely to say help people than black people or Hispanic people who want to become cops. We know though that people dream about being police since childhood, that people are inspired by law and order SVU to become police officers. And we know that people can take college classes with criminal justice practitioners and get pushed into the field. What do we know about corrections officers? Why do people become COs? That is probably the top question I get constantly. Why did you do that? <laughs> Why did you become a CO? So let's talk about what the literature says about that. Right? We know that corrections is actually among the least desirable profession across any criminal justice profession. No one wants to go to jail, again, whether or not you're getting paid for it. Right, But among those that say they're interested, criminal justice majors, are they're more likely to be criminal justice majors. We also know for people that are currently working in corrections, right, they're drawn to the field because of the financial security and stability. Right? And we know that this, again, can vary with sex and race and ethnicity. For example, females most likely never consider working in the field of corrections, right, compared to males. And so we know then that people are motivated to get into the field for different things, but sex can shift it and race, ethnicity can, can shift it. But what we don't know is how skin tone matters. Right? Even though we know that skin tone is a distinctly different concept than race and ethnicity, right? That being light, medium, or dark skin, right? Having a higher concentration of melanin in your, in your body, having less Eurocentric features, all of these things can drastically shape our interaction with the justice system and other institutions. For example, we know that Blacks in the United States um, um, are kind of the receivers of harsher treatment, right, for in terms of discrimination. But we know that this harsher treatment is intensified when that Black person is a darker skinned individual. We also know that colorism is so pervasive that it's also true for the white race. Right? So darker skinned white people have a higher probability of being arrested than their lighter skinned white counterparts. Right? So I'll say it again, skin tone is so pervasive that it's even true for the race that is least racialized, right? Even for white people, skin tone matters, right? But we have not ex yet explored the role of identity in terms of skin tone for people who want to be criminal justice professionals or work in law enforcement. And so that is the purpose of my study today. We're gonna to explore how skin tone impacts college students' perceptions of criminal justice occupation desirability. So the data from this study, ah, uh, dancing with the data, right? And so the data from the study is from a larger project. It's a mixed message project I call Shades of Justice, right? And so this is a mixed message project I conducted in the spring of 2020 and the summer of 2020. And for the purposes of our presentation today, we're only going to be focusing on my spring data, the quantitative portion, which was an electronic survey distributed across the United States to graduate and undergraduate students majoring or concentrating in fields related to criminology or criminal justice. The instrument asked about how their perceptions of their skin tone, colorism, right, their occupational aspirations, and the criminal justice system more broadly. So the data, right? So um, I look at three um, distinct dependent variables, the desirability of criminal justice profession. So we're looking at law enforcement, right? We're paying particular attention to corrections, right? But cops, corrections, and being a special agent. Now I threw special agent in this one because one, it's interesting because special agents are law enforcement officers, but they also are like the most prestigious right, arguably. And we know that prestige matters for these things. It's also a draw for motivation. And the DVs are measured on Likert scale ranging from one to five with five being very desirable. The independent variables are collapsed into three clusters. The first being reasons that people choose their career path, 
right? So strongly agree to um, strongly disagree to strongly agree, right? So people that agree that they want to arrest bad guys, that they want to make a good salary, that they want to have positive reputations in their community, that they want to make a difference, right? Followed by perceptions of justice. People who agree with the statement that life in prison is actually worse than the death penalty, that the criminal justice system is fair to black people, that prisoners that receive benefits like free education while they're incarcerated, that that is actually disrespectful to victims of crime. And finally, independent variables related to skin tone. The perception that skin color is important to the way people perceive themselves and whether or not people perceive themselves as light, medium, or dark skin. And we're controlling for a range of things, including income, age, sex, and of course, whether or not people are majoring in criminology or criminal justice versus related fields. And the table one in all its glory, right? And so I have, um, shaded ones related to identity and just some interesting ones for us to focus in on. So the sample of 590 is 75% female, right? The average age is 24, 57% white, 15% black, 14% Hispanic, and 13% other, right? And maybe, you know, positive thing that the vast majority of people that say they're choosing a career path um, in criminal, criminal justice, these career paths, well, they want to make a difference. Right, that does feel good. That's a fuzzy, right? Um, and then 1.32, right? So the vast majority of participants also perceive themselves as lighter skinned, right? One is light and three is dark. And 65% are majoring in directly in criminology or criminal justice. So some pretty tables for univariate statistics just to hone in how no one wants to be a CO, right? Um, so green is special agent. Yellow is corrections officer and orange is for cop, right? And we can see, and again, just univariate statistics, but the differences are staggering, right? If you really take a look at the, the, the data, there's no co comparison. No one, the corrections officer, that's the least desirable profession, followed quickly by cop, right? And then you can see the contrast with special agent in green as being more a more desirable field. Excellent. Okay, so time for the good stuff. Here goes the ugliest table of the table two. So I ran um, generalized logistic regression models. And I did that because the dependent variables are measured in Likert, right? And so I did three models, um, cop, corrections officer, and special agent. But it also allows for relaxed um, assumptions for proportional odds and had a couple of variables that did some funny fun things. So this model was most appropriate. So a lot to take in here, but we'll walk through it step by step right about now. So model one, right, cop desirability, right? So this again is graduate and undergraduate students, they're rating the how, how, how desirable they find being a cop. And so we see that it seems to be driven by perceptions of justice, fairness, rights. And so individuals that say they're choosing their career path to protect the constitution because they wanna arrest bad guys, because they wanna make a difference. Um, and people that also agree with the statement that if prisoners receive free benefits, it's actually disrespectful to victims of crime, those people are statistically more likely to find being a cop desirable, a desirable profession, right? Interestingly, those who are choosing their career path to protect the oppressed, right, are actually their, the odds of them finding being a cop um, desirable are reduced compared to their counterparts. And that's interesting because the creed of um, police in the United States is often protect and serve, but apparently not oppressed in, in some people's minds, right? Diversity in sex, though, seems to be a continual struggle, right? So we see that females, um, the odds of females finding being a cop desirable are significantly less than males. Race, ethnicity, and skin tone are not influential, right? They're not statistically significant in cop desirability ratings. Moving on to model two in terms of being a correctional officer, right? Again, arresting bad guys, right? Individuals who agree that they're choosing their career to arrest bad guys are likely to find being a CO desirable. Um, same thing in terms of um, people who believe that prisoners getting benefits are disrespectful to crime victims. Race ethnicity, again, is not statistically significant, neither is skin tone, right? But it's important here to remember the univariate table in the beginning. College students don't seem to find being a CO exciting. They're not enthused about that profession. So future studies really should tap the populations that are more excited. So we can really understand the motivations of why are people becoming COs? 
Right? And so some suggestions, right? Retired military folks, people coming straight out of high school, right? Really tapping the right sample is critical so we can understand this population. Also, it challenges this idea that education, 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 what would be the implications of us raising the educational requirement from, for a CO in the United States from a high school or GED equivalent to a college degree? The implications of that are major because college educated folks or people that are pursuing college degrees seem to be largely uninterested. Right? And so it's important that scholar practitioners, as we make these, these suggestions or recommendations, that we keep those things in mind, right? Paper and practice need to connect at some point. It's critical to the study. Finally, um, the desirability for special agents. And ha, we're about to talk about race. So again, people who feel like they are choosing their career path to arrest bad guys, to make a difference, people that think that life in prison is worse than the death penalty, all of these people are more likely to, um, the odds of them finding this being a special agent desirable are increased. Again, we find the opposite relationship for people who are choosing to protect the oppressed. But here race matters, right? So we find that statistically significant Blacks and Hispanics respectively, the odds of them wanting to be a special agent has actually increased compared to their race and ethnic counterparts holding all other things constant. But skin tone matters too, right? Darker skinned individuals, the odds of darker skinned individuals finding being a special agent desirable actually is reduced. So again, there's tension there or, or tension that we would, we, would, we would throw around, right? So what does it mean if Blacks and Hispanics, right, statistically find being a special agent desirable, but darker skin folks don't? What does that mean in practice, right? How diverse is this sample and what, what kind of diversity should we be tapping if skin tone is, uni is uniquely different? So implications for future research, right? So future generations of criminal justice professionals still want to arrest bad guys. So this was statistically significant across all models. And, and it's important to really hone in on that fact because the way we write this up currently in the literature is that people are drawn to these professions for excitement, for adrenaline, right? I have a completely different read. That what's really happening is that it's proof that this us versus them mentality that is so pervasive in the system, right? It's actually, it starts before socialization. People aren't learning that when they become cops or COs. That's, it's not just that, right? People have an idea of who bad guys are and what should happen punitively to bad guys, even in college as they're choosing their careers. Next, that um, college educated individuals who find corrections and policing desirable are also more likely to report um, orientations that are more punitive than restorative. For example, these college um, degree pursuing individuals believe that prison benefits like free education is disrespectful to crime victims. So what story are we telling in terms of the hope for rehabilitation? Right, in our facilities, the hope for restoration and successful reintegration. Right, so we've got a long way to go with that, even among the college elite. Okay, and finally, that working in law enforcement at the federal level is found to be more desirable by Blacks and Hispanics, but not darker skinned individuals. So skin tone matters, and this is super exciting because it's actually the first like empirical idea, like this quantitative proof that we need to be thinking about these in really important and distinct ways. So there's a call for qualitative work and um, the second phase of Shades of Justice, which I just completed, there's a hundred, I conducted a hundred interviews with a research team. So I'm really excited to continue wading through the coding that is data analysis, but I'm super excited about that. So thank you so much for your attention. Um, this was amazing. I um, mean, you can reach, it, reach me here, card.american.edu, and I look forward to an amazing discussion. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, um, Dr. Carter. And we now move over to Dr. Richard Daly. Thanks. I'm just sharing my screen and getting it working. Um, sorry, guys. So um, my presentation, my present today is and my presentation is an ethnographic experience of the correctional officer training program at the National Training Academy of Correctional Service Canada. 
So for this presentation, I analyzed my field notes, participant experiences, and the ethical challenges I faced during the three stages of the correctional training program in Canada. This includes a 14-week in-person component, and then I unpacked the socialization experience of the training to become a correctional officer for CSC. So the current study, um, generally most correctional service related ethnograph ethnographic or semi-ethnographic studies focus on prisoner experiences with a fewer scholars focusing on correctional officers experiences. Um, often we're conducting interviews alongside participant observation, field work, and it can vary in the degree the researcher becomes immersed in the field of study. So I studied, I structured this presentation. I'm first going to talk about my methods, then I'll give you guys the situational context, and then I speak to some ethical considerations before discussing the processes of socialization in some very explicit, specific forms. I don't cover everything because it's 20 minutes. So methods. I engaged in living with and living like those who were studied. I participated openly without deception in three stages of the correctional training program. The first stage occurs online. It's four weeks in duration. The second is a series of homework assignments, each to be completed prior to arriving at the academy for a 14 week in-person component, which is stage three of the CTP. The in-person component of training involved going to Ontario, I'm from Newfoundland, living in a dorm, uh, a room that could have been a cell and it was all furnished by Corkhan among other recruits, participating in all components of the training. This includes instructional hours from about 8.30 to 8 to about 3.30, 4 o'clock every day, Monday through Friday. I observed adherence to the rules of CTP participation, the regulations directive put forth by the training academy. They governed everything from how we organized dorm rooms, dressed, how I did my hair, to fitness, pretty well any aspect of it. I participated in um, the decision-based training scenarios. I did exercises in decarceration. I did all the firearms training. Um, and I was pepper sprayed. But throughout all of it, I maintained this different lens of a researcher despite what was going on. So when participating in CTP each day in uniform, I used field notes to record my daily experiences. So the observations, the interactions, and what I refer to as training notes, which I made as I reviewed the hundreds of pages of training content. Um, to complement my experience, I've also done 354 interviews with uh, recruits at the academy um, starting in 2018. And I've done interviews with trainers at both current academies in Canada. So my ethnographic role is complex. It was marked with role ambiguity when first entering the field. And I recognized that I was a known observer and I was never going to truly belong in the, or like as a recruit. The CTP experience combined the nuance of an organizational ethnography. So providing insight into organizational culture, organizational learning and identity formation with the insight of appreciative inquiry. Um, in that context, it was, it was really, I approach criticalness within the context of the greater good, the objectives of the academy and the readiness to find positive ways to make change. Um, to be fair, my approach was to learn procedures, but also the reasoning behind the procedures to understand the greater context legally, professionally and practically of the material that was being taught and all the actions of those being researched. So like Sparks and Jex, I too found that the interweaving of biography, experience and fieldwork and the potential for criticism for my actions and non-actions proved paralyzing at times, particularly when reflecting on the CTP experience and particularly when writing up my findings. So give you a little bit of the situational context. If you follow the link that's on here, it'll give you kind of, you can see what the academy looks like. This is a training academy in Kingston. It has three active CTPs at all times. So cohorts participating. The um, maximum size is 30, 32. My CTP was significantly smaller, had 25 people, including me. I was worried I would need a fair amount of guidance and directed instruction as I did the training. Because unlike all the other recruits, I had not made a career choice that required the training. I was not being, I had never been recruited, I had never applied, and I've never worked as a correctional officer, and I will never work as a correctional officer. CTP was the means um, for others to a well paying federal career. And across all the recruits, their occupational pursuits occur with life happening in ways that would intrude into their experiences, distracting from their focus, and like I experienced, be cause for being homesick, um, concern, hurt, anxiety, and sometimes distress. But also, your group is a source of support. So, recruits had families they were leaving for a solid 14 weeks. My fellow recruits have left children, including an infant, um, significant others, friends and loved ones to participate in CTP. So my presence there, it was noticeable to some. Um, three of the recruits in my CTP had been released from their previous experience and were trying a second time. So it was null to many and anyone who did see me was likely indifferent. Nevertheless, I really felt like I had a spotlight shining on me. It was probably attributed to my nerves, not reality, and a spotlight that likely was felt, desired or hated by every recruit in the training. 
Unlike the other recruits, I had a few self-imposed restrictions on my participation that I had decided on as a researcher prior to getting there. The first is I wasn't competing, completing 14 consecutive weeks at CTP. I would take these work breaks. Um, and it was in these periods of breaks that um, also confirmed to me just how immersive and consuming the CTP experience was. On my re-entry to the field, I saw how dynamics changed within the group and the constant role in negotiations that all recruits endured during CTP. So we're gonna talk a little bit about some of these ethical challenges. The first is navigating consent. Um, a key struggle during the, ethnograph the ethnographic experience is that the persons involved in the ethnography, those that I was interacting with, they did not actively provide ongoing consent. It's not like I asked them every day, you know, reminding everyone, do you consent to me being here? So I would bear witness to the trials and tribulations of their performance, and they watched my many trials and tribulations. So for example, as I write up my ethnographic experience, I struggled with how to report on occurrences that change the atmosphere in CTP. For example, the first time a recruit is sent home is really dramatic and has some effects on everyone in the court because someone going home makes the idea that you can go home very real. It confirms that not everyone's going to complete CTP, and but the story of that first time a recruit goes home is personal and perhaps not something that they want written up. There's also the insider-outsider bind. So from the moment I entered the field, I started this perpetual and consistent process of navigating my position as a researcher versus that of a very, very new, very green recruit. And as a researcher, I also needed to stay cognizant of the objectives of the training and of the greater academy. And that might seem simple, but the multiple roles created a lot of role conflict. I faced perpetual tension. When I introduced myself to my cohort, my trainers had already met me, but I still don't know if they actually were given a choice about my participation in their classes. I renegotiated my role in the field and my positioning regularly. I was socially integrated to the in the field as a complete member, but my affiliation intentionally stayed closer to that of an outsider in comparison to that of an insider. My outsider status limited my investment in the ever-changing social dynamics around CTP and created the critical distance necessary to hold a keen focus on the training and the organizational socialization. Staying largely an outsider in my experience was ethically necessary to manage the dilemmas of consent, those of relationships, and that that can be tied to status and power in the different ways it can be understood. There's also the moral bind, and this ties into values and integrity. So CSC stresses the importance of alignment between the values and ethics of each recruit and the organization's mandate and the job description of a CO. For instance, the academy places demands and expectations on recruits, expecting that a minimum standard of behavior is met. But if a recruit falls short of that standard, something that will occur with or without intention, um, my role was to stay neutral. Um, values and ethics constitute modules of study within the training program. During CTP, recruits were refreshed about behaving ethically and developing virtues, even going so far as to remind recruits that immoral decisions can result in discomfort, concern, and stress. CSC actually reminds recruits, and I'm quoting again, without a doubt, the most important attribute of an individual applying for a job in law enforcement are the applicant's integrity and moral behavior. In order to be a law enforcement officer, individuals must demonstrate a life lived morally. So CSC trains recruits by discussing values and ethics in relation, for instance, to the application of on-duty discretion, a solidarity among staff and sources of corruption, like failing to report wrongdoings when they occur. In training, CSC emphasizes values and ethics code for, um, the values and ethics code for the public sector as established by the Treasury Board of Canada and their mission and value statement. So the values for CSC are respect, fairness, professionalism, inclusivity, um, accountability, and critical thinking. So to assess with our own reflexi reflexivity as recruits, CSC also introduced a process through which we were to consistently over the course of training reflect our own, our own actions and, the um, and our ethical behaviors. So part of the process involves literally sitting down with your trainers and having them talk about your behaviors and your comportment and see how they interpret and how it's reflected back. Um, the process provided external insight into our actions as recruits, both recognized and centralized the relation element of the CEO role being a CEO is about relationships with your colleagues, your prisoners, management, and the public. And CSC's emphasis placed on values and ethics is extensive and comprehensive. And as I observed, it was practiced and applied. It was not just words. The challenge, um, as you would reasonably accept, is that everyone, like every recruit across all CTPs, cannot or will not meet the ethical and value-based standards of CSC consistently over the 14 weeks. Probability supports that there are going to be some outliers. So over the course of my CTP experience within my cohort of 24 other, 24 actual recruits, 25th person being me, CSC released two individuals based on their interpretation of their personal fit with the values and ethics of the organization. So they actually really take it seriously. The releasing of recruits based on ethics and values is not a rarity at the academies. The practice confirms that probability 
process are in place to assess the integrity of potential hires at CSC. But as an ethnographer, the practice creates a really uncomfortable space that you need to navigate and it requires ongoing reflection. There were also additional ethical concerns was the relationship. This picture is my CTP on the graduation day. I'm not in the picture because I wouldn't put on the final work uniform. Um, but one of the concerns here about the relationships is that I didn't want to disrupt the natural flow of relationships that would be built, nor interfere with the bonds that develop between the individuals. And I did not want to interfere with the support that recruits provide for each other. So while I was there, I tried to ensure that I was not a person's only person. I realized I had my persons too in CTP, who I depended on. I took comfort in connecting with as I managed the stresses of being away from home. Yet I could never discuss my experiences at the academy, given the confidentiality I owed each person. So I tried not to interfere with the CTP experience of any recruits. But at the end of the day, although I ideally each person should not be affected by my participation, I can't guarantee that. I participated, I interacted, I was there on the first day of class and I was there at graduation. So there's many other ethical considerations, but I'm gonna move forward. So this in the, the picture, that's my shoulder in uniform. That's the closest to me in a uniform that I will post. So one of my main concerns heading to CTP, um, sorry, for I'm gonna turn now, sorry about that, to discuss socialization processes. So for clarity, training I speak of as the proficiencies taught and manifest, as well as the formal message surrounding each proficiency. Socialization instead refers to the informal messages taught at the academy, as well as the latent lessons that are derived from training. And training and socialization, they don't just overlap, they occur simultaneously and each informs and shapes the other. So socialization through training represents a central means through CEOs anticipate their occupational work, prepare to perform their occupational responsibilities and learn their position within the organization including their degree of org, uh, occupational agency, discretion, expected commitment to their colleagues and the broader organization. So the first stages of CTP, I'm gonna talk about very, very quickly. Um, what became very clear in the socialization there is commitment. It takes time, effort and dedication as a professor over four weeks, it was taking me more than 40 hours a week to get through all the material. Some of the content was aging, like a very old, very archaic and system. So it was a lot of effort, a lot of time, and it was a complete, it was complete dedication. And then there's a the stress of testing. And I'll talk more about that in stage three. So organizations, they invest tremendously in recruit and staff training. Yet without an examination of socialization within an academy, the outcomes of training intended or not are completely ambiguous. We just don't know. And there's very little research on how CEOs are socialized through their training or once they're working within the institution. So I use here the, um, the typology, the theory of organizational socialization to understand socialization processes inherent to the structure, the actual structure of the training academy, while noting the key elements of the informal socialization that the recruits are experiencing. Um, organizational social socialization by Van Manen is the process by which an organizational member learns the required behaviors and supportive attitudes necessary to participate as a member of an organization. Organizational socialization also teaches the organizational culture. So if we look at this typology, there are six um, socialization tactics, each producing different role orientations, degrees of ambiguity, conflict among recruits, as well as variance in job satisfaction, commitment, and occupational learning. There are five tactics that are relevant to the uh, current study. Those are collective versus individual, formal versus informal, sequential versus random, fixed versus variable, and serial versus disjunctive. So collective tactics, for instance, is common learning experience designed to standardize responses and thus socialize recruits to accept the organizational standards tied to the occupational role. Individualized socialization tactics, on the other hand, allow for heterogeneity in responses of recruits by providing unique learning opportunities rather than standardizing so there's more innovation in how recruits can respond. So specifically, individual, informal, variable, random, and disjunctive socialization tactics, what Jones refers to in 1986 as individualized socialization tactics, are to correlate with innovative role orientations, where the institutional socialization tactics are to result in more situational consistency in how people um, experience or engage in the role. So here at CSC, if we reflect on the typology, the training environment at the academy uses formal, so recruits are separated from the employees, fixed, we adhere to a timetable, we really adhere to a timetable, sequential, we're informed about the occupational role, it's collective, common learning experience, and serial, all trainers are experienced CEOs. Um, the expectation is for trainers at the academy to perform as role models for the recruits, while the academy socializes recruits in a manner that encourages standardized responses while approaching situations and promotes organizational commitment. Organizational commitment was like the key thing throughout there that we kept hearing, but there's an individual caveat. 
So here I'm returning to the discussion of integrity, where there's an ex exception to standardized responses. Um, here we see institutional socialization tactics, standardized responses, but an individualized emphasis. So at the academy, this contradictory kind of message emerges where the academy atmosphere and lessons encourage collective solidarity and camaraderie among the recruits and collective responses, but it reminds recruits to stay self-focused enforcing that each recruit is accountable for their own actions or their roles in the actions of others. Recruits are both to, both to be bonded and split. On the one hand, ready to have each other's backs, and on the other, we are never to turn a blind eye towards concerning behaviors. So recruits appear to be socialized to what I refer to as caveated camaraderie, where recruits learn the value of collective solidarity and camaraderie, but only as far as recruits act with the integrity and abide to the behavioral expectations of the organization. What results is this slight lacing and mistrust around colleagues that lags at the level of solidarity among a cohort. So when you're working in an environment that breeds hypervigilance and surveillance as characteristics of employees, it's not surprising that it also inadvertently socializes officers to be reserved with their trust. So at the same time, so you have this kind of split and bonding that's going on, you have this collective underpinning. So the environment at CTP is laden with stress. Um, you get yelled at and you learn a lot and you get yelled at and you learn a lot. So particularly navigating the testing in the strike system is stressful. So depending on who one speaks with, the pressure imposed by the strikes is either intentional, so it's designed to reflect the tensions in prison work, or it's an unintended consequence of CTP. No matter where it comes from, the env environment is stressful at times, and stress weaves itself into the fabric of experience through the testing, shaping the CTP culture. So there are over 50 strikes that recruits can acquire, three strikes and basically you get sent home. Um, each is tied to examination of a specific series of skills and knowledge. Um, if a recruit earns three strikes, the recruit has failed to complete CTP and departs. There are test and retest policies. The threat of earning a strike not only affects recruits as they stress not passing a test, but also creates bonds between recruits as we study and train to pass each test together. Ironically, testing is this intersection of individual and institutional socialization tactics. The strike system, it creates dependence between the recruits or pairs of recruits because you have to rely on each other for practical reasons. Two specific ones that are worth noting is to practice for your testing and actually to perform the test. You can't do arrest and control or self-defense by yourself. It just doesn't work. It's very ineffective. So given recruits can help each other when testing versus when tested individually, the dependence is even more important because a trusted colleague is an invaluable support when testing. So a common area where recruits earn strikes is firearm modules. Here recruits can earn two strikes on um, in the first day, um, in one day, so they can easily go home if they already have a strike. So there are three uh, sequential strikeable tests. So each recruit has to pass the first, which is theory, to move on to the second, which is the firearm manipulation, and the third is qualification. And then we do carbine, pistol, and shotgun. So there's lots of opportunity for strikes. I found shooting exceptionally stressful on testing days because a recruit who is often a friend may be sent home and the possibility of being rewarded a strike was consuming, even for me who wasn't going to be a correctional officer. So I had a job, I couldn't be sent home for strikes. I did not have the same stress as the recruits, but I felt stress and could only imagine how my colleagues felt. Receiving a strike is stress as stressful. Trainers remind the recruits that they must maintain their composure and that composure is essential for the job. Um, I felt really bonded to all the people I did my remedial training with after I received a strike on non-millimeter. So the release process itself solidifies bonds um, between those who remain and instills the realness of the interview process. It's a shared high pressure experience that reinforces bonds, but simultaneously, simultaneously the pressure can also create conflict between the recruits. So we have this caveated solidarity and camaraderie that is again learned, which perhaps shed light on researchers findings, including my own, that if I ask COs about their greatest sources of stress, um, if it's prisoners, if it's um, colleagues, if it's the public, if it's management, they often say they're colleagues. So it could have, there could be some ties. So basically, overall, underpinning both individualized and collective training practices, as well as institutional socialization tactics, is the value placed on the effective, moral, and continuous elements of organizational commitment, which reinforces that recruits are psychologically committed, organizationally loyal, and invested in CSC. Although caveated camaraderie is taught, the pressure-infused training environment produces strong bonds between the recruits in focusing on both the individual recruits and the greater collective. I still, to this day, am in contact with many people from my CTP. Um, what is really needed is research into onboarding after training. So how recruits are onboarded into the training once they enter the institution to see if the adherence to what is learned at the academy continues. But what I can say is that when you're at the academy, you actually learn strategies for how to continue to engage in the way that you were taught at the academy when working in the field. 
Also um, really noteworthy to note is that there's a drive and a dedication required to become a CO for CSC. The amount of time, effort, and the commitment, it's four weeks and then a couple other weeks and then 14 weeks in person away from your family and continuously training. So that commitment, I don't think is always recognized, the amount of effort and dedication that goes into the job. Um, yeah, and that's about the end of my presentation. If you look at the, just because I have 20 seconds, if you look at the coin in the top corner of the screen, it says 1342. So that was, that's my recruit number or my, when I finished, that was the coin with my number of graduate from the training academy. And I welcome anyone's feedback. And since we're doing this online version, if anyone wants to email or reach out to me in other ways, I would appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Richardelli. And lastly, we will turn to William Schultz. I think it's been uh, really fun just to sit and listen to these presentations. <clears throat> and if I find what I find interesting is I do my work over here in this bubble that we're all in with COVID, and yet I hear uh, uh, people like Dr. Richardelli and Dr. Carter dealing with very similar issues to the ones that I've experienced and seen. And it's just, it's super fun for me to present here first off, but also to see, hear how p different people are approaching these, these issues from different lenses. So today I'm gonna revisit a concept that's been bumping around the literature and correctional officers for some time, <clears throat> namely perceptions of vulnerability among correctional staff and how prisoner, prison officers often see themselves as vulnerable. Now, this isn't a new topic. Uh, I mean, for instance, Dr. Riccardelli wrote an article on this some years ago. But the data I'm presenting today suggests that it, it's very advantageous for us to revisit this topic and reframe it, because it may help us to understand some important aspects of how CEOs think, react, and uh, generally do their lives. <clears throat> So I'll run through uh, the methods quickly before I get into the meat of my presentation here. Uh, I'm a part of the University of Alberta Prisons Project. I work with uh, Dr. Sandra Basarius and Kevin Haggerty. Um, and the, the project, or the UAPP as we call it, so far has gone into three federal penitentiaries and four provincial prisons. Uh, and it's, in total, it's interviewed roughly 700 uh, or 800 prisoners and 170 correctional officers. But I'm specifically drawing the data I discuss here from 131 semi-structured interviews I did with uh, provincial correctional officers in four of uh, four of the jails. Uh, the prisons where we drew are these, the sample from range from minimum security uh, centers housing about 100, 350 people to maximum security remand centers that uh, were housing over 1,700 when we were there. And the officers we interviewed were also very diverse. Uh, ranging from rookies who'd been doing the job for less than a year to officers who are in the process for re of retiring after 35 years on the job. Uh, men significantly outnumbered uh, women across our sample um, and uh, non-white people only, I only had about uh, 10 or 15 non-white participants in this group. So, uh, however, this is fairly representative of the population of the officers in the areas where we, uh, we did our research. Um, one important addendum to this before I begin is my own positionality in uh, relation to this research. So I actually worked as a correctional officer at the prison we call Silverside Correctional for five years before I started grad school. Uh, I went through all the training uh, and all that sort of stuff. Um, and I don't want to linger on my own positionality because I'd rather let my participants do the talking, but it definitely influenced how, um, some, of, how some of these themes came to the surface. And I'm happy to discuss that in the questions later on if anybody's curious. Um, but throughout our sample and throughout the interviews we did, officers expressed significant levels of stress, um, either for themselves or for the coworkers that they worked with. Yet, they, instead of just discussing stress, they also consistently and repeatedly linked the stress they experienced with a wide range of factors that left them feeling vulnerable. Now, this led to two fairly simple research questions, which are, how do perceptions of vulnerability shape correctional officer behavior in prison? And also, how do the perceptions of work-related vulnerability impact correctional officers outside of their jobs. Now, these are not revolutionary questions. Um, There's a significant body of really great research I encourage you to all go and read. And to pay the very briefest of lip service to this, we know that correctional officers are suspicious, they tend to be conservative, they're control focused, uh, they and they're very willing to use force to maintain control of the, the prisons where they work. 
Um, there's a significant amount of work on uh, inappropriate behavior of various sorts, as well as hypermasculinity, which shapes the uh, subcultures within the prison. Um, but these two questions relate to one of the fastest growing areas of correctional uh, research. Much of the recent work around correctional staff is focused on the impact of stress and mental health. Um, Work-related stress is now viewed as the root of many of the other issues we've observed with prison staff over the years, ranging from poor staff retention to subcultural allegiance to high, alarmingly high levels of diagnosed uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. This is so much the case that um, many authors place stress and mental health at the center of this kind of the CO experience. Um, and one example of this is that governments in Canada have recently uh, declared correctional work to be a presumptive cause of post-traumatic stress disorder. But underneath this framework of agreement, there's little kind of co cohesiveness about exactly why stress is such a massive problem. Now, one school of thought when it looks at this looks at the kind of risks that CEOs experience. In volatile spaces like prison, uh, CEOs often face assaults, exposure to drugs, lots of things like that. Yet this same research also demonstrates that these incidents, while common, aren't common enough to explain the sheer level of uh, stress that CEOs are reporting. Likewise, other, uh, another school of thought is looking at um, how individual officers experience stress and what the consequences of this experience stress is. But again, although this is research addresses a portion, it, it can't identify the entire phenomenon. And so in essence, the, my reading of the, the work in this area suggests that the sum of these explanations for the causes of stress aren't enough to explain what's going on. So what is going on? And what I argue and what comes out of my data is that um, their perceptions of vulnerability and correctional officers' perceptions of their own safety, their own kind of positionality within the workplace is a major structuring factor in affecting almost every aspect of how they do their lives. Officers always told us they felt vulnerable. But, and, and the works touched on vulnerability, but vulnerability in the literature so far has talked about specific and measurable risks. And what officers told us about were, was a less concrete, more kind of diffuse sense of generalized and constant unease. Something that was difficult to define, but something that was extremely crucial that in shaping the way they interacted with prisoners, managers, and each other. And officers continue to describe these perceptions of vulnerability as influencing their actions, perceptions, and sort of general habitus of officers throughout the data. Now, officers describe three sources of perceived vulnerability. And I'm gonna run through these and just try to demonstrate how these become a structuring factor shaping almost every aspect of the correctional officer sort of mindset. Um, the first uh, source of vulnerability they discussed was unsurprisingly prisoners. Um, outnumbered by a ratio between 25 to 1 and 36 to 1 across our data set, officers were constantly aware that they only ran the units because the prisoners allowed them to run the units. And this directly shaped their behavior, and often in good ways. As Officer Malcolm put it, you can only be so much of a hard ass until it's you and 60 inmates alone on the range. Violence in these situations was undoubtedly a concern to officers, but intriguingly, it was not a major concern. Violence was part of the job, but emphatically, violence was just part of the job. It was something that they understood. It was a risk they knew and felt capable of dealing with it through the training they'd received. Rather, when prisoners discuss prison, oh, when officers discuss prisoners as a source of vulnerability, they talked about less concrete, more diffuse threats, which were just as influential, but were harder to define or stop. So for instance, during our research, prisoner drug use, specifically of fentanyl, was becoming a major issue within the centers. And Officer Nathan discussed the influence of this in uh, like this, quote, with the fentanyl, we pray ourselves through a lot of the days nowadays because it's so prevalent. The anticipation that you could come on the ship, you could do a round in the middle of the night and you'll find somebody not breathing. This stuff is just so dangerous. Fentanyl pr pr use was a major concern for prisoner safety, of course, but officers also viewed it as a safety, uh, as a threat both to their own safety and to their own job safety and that they would sometimes be found liable for these issues. And I'll touch on that in a second. But we, this also affected officer behavior in very specific ways. So for instance, we observed officers who refused to enter cells until they were assured by the uh, prisoners that there was no fentanyl in those spaces. And this was not just idle like fear mongering. Randy, I interviewed uh, about two or three months after he'd been hospitalized for uh, what was on the, appeared to be on the drug, uh, on the job drug exposure. 
Cool. That night I spent in the hospital, I'll be honest, if I could afford it, I would have quit that day. I would have pulled the pin right that day if I had something else. I'd rather go toe-to-toe -to -toe with a guy than be exposed to fentanyl. I'd rather take a shift than be exposed to fentanyl. The emergence of new drugs made the already risky arena of prison work even more unstable and uncertain for officers. And it added a significant and amorphous hazard that increased the sense of danger that officers experienced on a daily basis and provi providing frequent reminders to officers of their own potential vulnerability, especially as they saw coworkers like Randy going to the hospital with weird symptoms. Now, the second major source of vulnerability that officers discussed was prison management. Now, to be clear, officers usually describe decent relationships between frontline staff and frontline managers who were able to talk to each other face to face. But the relationship between CEOs and upper level management, the more bureaucratic side of the institution was far more contested. Officers usually frame the bureaucratic institution as interested in protecting itself, irrespective of how that influenced officers. Alyssa put it this way, corrections is a high risk job and it's high risk in almost every aspect you look at it. Feeling unsupported by management is probably the worst part. Like if you have managers that will throw you under the bus to save their own skin, that's an unnerving way to feel about your job. As Allison Liebling pointed out in a 2006 article, operational power in prisons has increasingly become centralized in administrative and management positions over the last 30 years. Frontline discretionary power has been largely replaced with direct managerial control through um, policies, procedures, and the like. This is best practices is wide and has played a key role in helping to improve the protection of prisoner rights over the last 30 years. But as my participants described, Managerial control and adversarial management practices left CEOs feeling powerless, feeling like cogs in the large machine and finding themselves expendable. And they believed in the case of an incident, almost any incident, management would side with the inmates and screw officers, irrespective of what had happened. And we heard many stories that supported this, these flimsy uh, excuses where officers were punished. And Heather pulled no punches with uh, describing this. That's how a lot of this shit happens. We're at the bottom of the shit pile. So whenever shit comes down, it'll always land on us. No matter what happens in jail, they'll nail us quicker than anybody. Now, of course, officers didn't have an objective perspective on this. I'm not presenting an objective perspective. And, and there's some definitely some sour grapes in here as officers were didn't have a full picture of the pressures the institution and institutional managers faced. But the conflict between uh, officers and management was one of the most widespread themes that we encountered. And officers provided very specific ways that adversarial management practices changed their approach to the job. Reg discussed a very interesting example when he told us this. A prisoner charged, came charging at me and I hesitated. And when you hesitate, hesitation gets you killed. And I hesitated because those kinds of things are running through your mind all the time. The managers don't have your back. The managers never support you. So anyone who's ever worked in a prison or been through correctional training will understand that this is a, a surprisingly a huge statement. Uh, in the CO training that Reg went through, which I also went through um, at one point in time in life, officers were trained to instantly react in a case like this. This is a case where there is no gray zone. This is very much a case of justified use of force, where a prisoner may be trying to attack an officer. And even in training, if you pause, like Reg describes, uh, you face physical punishment and having the 200 plus pound role playing officer who was pretending to be the prisoner steamroll you, if only to make the point that you never hesitate, you always engage in the training as quickly as you can. Yet what Reg and other officers like him were describing were that management critiques, investigations and adversarial practices were directly causing officers to second guess their training, even in situations which impacted their own physical safety. So in the face of increased threats from prisoners and an, an eroded slash contested uh, relationship between management and officers, CEOs typically told me that the only people they trusted were other correctional officers. Now, this is no shock. Uh, CO literature is one of the, uh, is replete with examples of um, CO solidarity and that code between officers. Yet, although officers consistently reinforced the importance of officer solidarity, and they frequently discuss it as the biggest thing that kept them in the job, they also discussed significant incidents where coworkers placed them in dangerous and untenable situations due to that solidarity. For example, officer and prisoner violence was common in our research. Officers and management uh, stated that most of these use of force incidents were legal and justified. Prisoners had a different perspective. <laughs> 
But they also admitted that there were select groups of individuals and groups of officers who were willing to see just how far justified could be pushed in the regular practice of day-to-day -day, uh, prison work. And these officers directly relied on these codes of solidarity to as cover for their actions, thereby placing other officers who weren't engaged or willing to be part of this in distinct places of risk. Matt put it this way, that's the thing that's almost terrifying. You go into a code, there's, there's certain guys I go work with. I'm like, well, if he decides to go and fight an inmate, I have to have a game plan in my mind. There's a potential lawsuit. Yes, I could lose my job, but that's not the worst thing. I could be dragged down and potentially charged. My go-to is if there's a fight, I'm like, I'll restrain the legs. Once he gets on the ground, I'll just grab his legs and stand there, backed out, looking at it, holding his legs and looking at the camera. Officers who are present in use of force incidents like this um, were you quite commonly dragged into investigations. And Matt described several incidents like exactly that, what he's describing. When this happened, they found themselves on the horns of a figurative dilemma with consequences no matter which way they went. They either broke the subcultural rules, which were a crucial part of maintaining their, their status within the prison the correctional officer group and ratted out their colleagues, or they lied to managers and investigators and perjured themselves. No matter which they chose, officers felt significant amounts of stress and they were in extreme positions of vulnerability where there was no right choice simply due to the situations they found themselves in. And solidarity in case like this played, uh, played CEOs in extremely vulnerable positions. And this was especially the case when prisons had specific groups of officers who kind of influenced, acted as a power group, who used their informal authority to influence the officer culture of a prison. Getting on the wrong side of a group like this was a significant risk for other officers. And Cody described it this way. Corrections is broken. Everyone bitches about how much they hate it. No one trusts management. Like everyone is us versus them. I don't trust staff. I've never had a con ever try to go after my livelihood, but I've had staff do it. My partners tried to get me fired. And dis disliked and distrusted by many of the other uh, of the officers at his center, Cody was actively considering quitting because of the significant challenge he faced to continue as an officer. And nor was he the only one. We heard many stories from officers who told us that they were very conscious that if they didn't do something right, according to the rules, they could be checked off by their coworkers if they crossed these subcultural boundaries. Almost every off aspect of the CEO world I investigated seemed to contribute to this general feeling of vulnerability and unease. No matter where they turned, officers found themselves in compromised situations, whereas the prisoners presented a risk to them, the officers, their coworkers did, and management were often on the lookout for any slip up. So yet, as on edge as vulnerable and as vulnerable as officers felt inside prison, it also represented a controlled space. One where officers typically knew exactly what they could expect and how to deal with it. They often had strategies like Matt describes where you back out of the room, back out of the way so the camera could see you weren't involved. Yet these strategies broke down when they left prison. Jared put it this way. I feel vulnerable. I came out here, I was single. I tried the whole online dating thing and I was told don't tell anyone what you do for a living until you see them in person, until you trust them. I've never... <laughs> And I was proud of my job, but it was a weird thing that I had to hide it because it felt vulnerable. And the structuring influence of these perceptions of vulnerability impacted officers outside the prison in, in a large realm of ways. A surprisingly large no, uh, number of officers told me that they'd lost relationships as a result of the stress, but they also told me that they were sometimes afraid to try and go on dates because they perceived themselves being judged. They perceived these, these uh, preconceptions about correctional officers caught in this impossible net and this cost impossible kind of back and forth officers exhibited an alarming array of stress related injuries across the data including um sometimes substance use as a way to kind of get down that jared goes on to tell us that he he's uh, on medically prescribed marijuana to deal with the amount of stress and these perceptions of vulnerability and he was by no means the only one who discussed this with us so as i conclude I, I'm not trying to make, and I want to add a quick caveat. I'm not trying to make any claims about what's right or wrong, what's good or bad in this. The officers I interviewed weren't angels, and often what they tried to do was maintain and prioritize control of the prison above anything, including discussions of what's right and wrong, good or bad. And sometimes their perceptions of what vulnerability were, quite, were uh, quickly and harshly contested by managers and prisoners who we interviewed, who downplayed the significance and influence of these factors. But Caveats aside, these data demonstrate something important, I'd suggest. CEOs describe these perceptions of vulnerability from almost everything that they encountered in the jail, 
as a massive structuring factor. It influenced how they thought. It influenced how they saw the world. It influenced how they reacted to things within prison. And within the, the data, officers describe uh, stress as these symptoms of these kind of widespread structures of perceived vulnerability. Uh, and, <clears throat> And as a result, these perceptions of vulnerability became one of the biggest factors structuring data throughout the research project. Now, if we stop and we begin to look at perceptions of vulnerability as a structuring agent, it, does, it has consequences for how we understand officer stress and mental health. First, officers viewed everything that they did essentially through these lenses. And um, it's what suggests that if we do not consider these widespread perceptions in our as we try to frame these these issues. Um, we may miss a crucial cause of what's causing stress and some of these negative subcultural allegiances. Second, although officer perceptions of vulnerability were contested, contested doesn't mean false. Um, perceptions in this case may be more influential than the the legitimate facts of the situation, whatever those may be. And in these cases, the perceptions of vulnerability were very influential and real in how they shaped officer actions. And so this is a factor which I suggest that researchers and correctional officers have perhaps overlooked and have overlooked how influential it may be. But overall, as I conclude, I believe that the prison staff essentially assess all prison reform efforts through these lenses of vulnerability. And consequently, if we attempt to introduce new programming or prison reform efforts and they fail to consider these sort of lenses of vulnerability, the, these programs are likely to fail or be rejected by officers simply because it doesn't take the, uh, their concerns into consideration. So I'm at time. Thank you for listening and I look forward to your questions. Thank you to all of our presenters. Um, Fascinating stuff. I'm struck by the sort of lineage across all three of the presentations, sort of the before, the questions around recruitment and um, motivations for these kinds of career tracks, then sort of the on, you know, training and then on the job. So I think that's a really um, interesting progression throughout all the presentations. We have a lot of questions. Um, so I'm going to do my best to jump around and pose to, so that if not everyone's getting uh, a bunch of questions all at once. So we'll start with Dr. Carter. And this question is from Kevin. Thank you for your talk. Given ostensible colorblind hiring practices, how might these issues of skin tone be taken into account in organizational practice in the criminal justice system? Yeah, it's an excellent question, um, Kevin. So a couple of things, just in terms of diversity, equity, and inclusion, if we do that right, skin tone should fall in line. But it's really about where we're getting people from. Right. So what's what's attractive? Like, is it, you know, former military officers? Right. Because that's also an organization that is dominated by males, dominated by whites. Right. So really thinking strategically about where recruitment efforts should come from in terms of hiring practices, about being transparent in terms of what it takes and and also offering structures that will allow people to see pathways there. S significant to the colorism literature is that darker skinned individuals um, are successfully transitioned from like, for example, high school to college or college to into their career, but lighter skinned people succeed in that transition quicker than darker skinned people, right? Um, and so significant to that then is that this idea that, um, so for example, not as um, Dr. Richard Daly in, in, you know, said in terms of weeks and weeks, you know, my CEO training was seven weeks, right? And so if the colorism literature is applied there, then perhaps longer periods to successfully transition into the field would be a more equitable, equitable way to take skin tone into account. So of course we can go layer by layer and see how colorism would play out, but really being transparent about the playing field, diversifying where the sample comes from in terms of recruitment, and also just being more gracious in terms of what successful correctional officers look like. Yeah, good question. Thank you, thank you for that response. Okay, this next question is for Dr. Richardelli from Luca. Great talk, curious about what the connection might be between what is taught in the academy and the realities of the actual job. Uh, maybe it's actually a bit of a question for, for Rose and for Will. <laughs> oh, actually all of you, actually everyone. So I'll, I'll speak to that really quickly. Um, the content in, in the training, there's, 
it's different than what we study when we go into a, a prison. Like when we're looking at a correctional officer vulnerabilities or we're looking at motivations to enter the field, like the content, when I go into a prison now, it's completely different. It's you walk in and from each station, and station is the wrong word, but each different space that each post you can occupy, all I see is the zillion of little steps that I was trying to remember that was involved in that. So there's actually direct applicability. But in, in the same content, there's some of the, you're socialized in the academy in such a way that when you enter the field, um, you're, you're prepared to do your job as you've been taught, but you're not necessarily ready for all the other dynamics that are coming into play with that. And you're also facing the challenges of how people do their job who've been in that particular, like every institution, every unit, every group, even who you work with is different. So it's not always, it's not gonna be a direct and immediate transition. And that's one of the reasons I said, we need more research into the onboarding programs because you can set something up incredibly as strongly as you want or as weakly as you want, but whatever happens, after that will determine how a person's orientation continues or the duration of their work. Well, I see both Will and Talisa nodding vigorously, so I would love to get any further comment from you that you want to offer. Um, I think Rose is making a real, uh, Dr. Richard Ellie, you make a really good point in that um, training is effective, but so the, the contrast between the training and the real world is some uh, real world of corrections for what's framed as the real world by correctional officers is sometimes really dramatic. And if you want to get into the cynical side of it, and I do, you talk to a lot of correctional officers who discuss it exactly this way, the way they frame it is that the training they give you in um, academy is what they'll use to punish you if you screw up later on, because that standard becomes sort of and effectively a defense of liability and that we've trained officers to do exactly this. And if you fail to do exactly this, you are now liable. Now, the problem is real world uh, experiences very rarely fit into the, the boxes that are carefully designed. Um, and that's where I think uh, there's a lot more research needed and a lot more discussion around what is the real world and how do we deal with these sort of aspects and these, these pressures. Yeah, absolutely. And echoing what was said, um, I've done some ethnographic work in terms of training um, in, in uh, two institutions um, in the United States. And I will just say that, um, one, in terms of what Will just said, punishment works is just as um, racially discriminant for correctional officers as it is for individuals that are being processed through the system, right? So we found, my research finds that black officers are treated or punished more, more harshly than their counterparts, one. And two, what training doesn't do oftentimes in my, um, my research, it doesn't tell you how to be a good CEO. It tells you what not to do, right? And so, so it's don't have, um, be careful about being um, close to inmates don't be caught one-on-one, -on -one, right? Um, don't do, don't abuse force, don't do this, don't do that. But what's missing is what to do, right? What's a healthy relationship like with an inmate, an offender, a resident, a client, whatever word you're using at this time, right? But what does a healthy interaction look like? We don't talk about that, right? It's don't wear, you don't wear your hair down, right? Don't wear earrings, right? But how can you express yourself in uniform? What does that look like? Right? Because it's taking and taking and restricting and controlling and controlling. But what can you do? Right? And that is so one of the most powerful quotes I've ever heard someone say is that the thing about corrections is no one, you don't, you know, if you do good work, you never see, you never see it. And that I think is a critical problem in terms of recruitment and retention. There's no good job. I mean, in the academy, we heart, I mean, what, we get pubs accepted, right? And some, 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 some smiles in a conference, but CEOs far less, far less affirmation. Well, maybe that ties into this question, which was again, addressed to all three of you, which is not surprising given the, the connections across your talks uh, from Sandra, which is thank you for your talks um, and to all of you. What do you think should be taught in training that is currently not taught? Where should the emphasis be and why? So you just tapped into that a little bit, Talisa, but maybe there's some more to fill in here and maybe some more gaps to fill in. This is something I actually talk about all the time and with CSC, with learning and development, with the academies, 
um, because they're constantly trying to grow their training, but still cram it into the 14 weeks. And when I say crammed in, like you get trained in a lot. I knew law and policy better than I would after taking any crim class. Like it, I, commissioner's directives, I'd read them all. And one of the things is that we really have a difficulty with is um, there's no trauma-informed care for the general CXs, PWs, so primary workers get trauma-informed care. Um, we need more on cultural competencies. Um, we need more about prisoner culture um, and what is, and some of the nuance that is going on in that context so people are aware more of these different realities. Um, I think those are, those are kind of, I, I could go on for a very long time, but those are sort of three things that I think are really key that need to be incorporated into the training for CXs. So CXs are correctional officers going to men's institution in the federal system, PWs are primary workers going to women's institutions. Okay, great. Thank you, everyone. This next question is for, so there's a lot in here, for, from Kevin to Will. Will, you mentioned the tensions between line officers and supervisors. How does the considerable discretion that officers have on a day-to-day -day basis play into the dynamics of vulnerability in relationship to supervisors? It's a good question. Um, and, and like, as I said, the, so what I, what I described within that is that centralization of control and power in the prison has placed a lot more, <clears throat> excuse me, a lot more uh, authority and responsibility with managers. But on the frontline basis, on the units, essentially policies and procedures are only as good as uh, the staff who are willing or able to inform it or to enforce it. But this is, and that is one place where there, it creates a ton of tension because there's a specific kind of checkbox list, a checkbox list of what you are supposed to do as a frontline officer. But yet, as uh, Dr. Carter put it so well, a lot of this is about what not to do or how to like reinforce and do all this sort of security stuff, which quite frankly, I remember very clearly in talking to lots of officers, doing this myself, but also talking to lots of officers, if, if you actually did everything that was required by the policy manual on a day-to-day -day basis, you would have open rev uh, rebellion on your hands because you would be typically described as a heat bag officer. <laughs> and so this immediately creates, it's, it builds the tension between frontline staff and managers right into the day-to-day the -day operations of corrections because in order to be a good CO, you typically have to know what to see and also what not to see. But if knowing what not to see is in direct violation of management uh, orders through policies, technically being a good CO is sometimes against the rules in, in the individual situations. And so it's a difficult question to answer. And again, I'm not saying sitting here and saying that discretion is always a wonderful thing because it can most definitely um, create some significant problems, but it, I, the, the kind of centralized control uh, through policies and procedures are really not, don't reflect the reality of the day-to-day -day reality of prison life. And that's, that's a problem for that relationship in particular. Thank you for that. Okay, so it's another question for all panelists. Um, if we understand carceral officer work as damaging, oh, sorry, this is from Justin. If we understand carceral officer work as damaging, what ought to be done to reduce the harms of imprisonment for both prisoners and prison staff while working towards reducing for proponents of penal moderation and or ultimately ending imprisonment for proponents of abolition? What is the role of criminology and criminological research facing this challenge? So it's a two part question. It's open to all of you. I'll happily take it. Um, so, in that, I'm just going to pull this forward. So the role of criminology and criminological research is really to unpack what's going on. We know that prisons are difficult for prisoners. We know that prisons are difficult for all staff working inside, all correctional workers. We know that prison and community corrections are exceptionally challenging for probation and parole officers and other people working in community corrections. And it's also challenging for people in administrative corrections that we often don't think about. And our role in criminology and 
uh, all of our research is to do what we can. There's no reason that a workplace should result in, you know, 55.6% of correctional staff resulting in a major mental disorder, right? There's no reason that we should see a workplace result in staff being unwell, and we shouldn't see uh, a place that is holding the most vulnerable populations. Like if you take all the vulnerable groups in our society and group all those persons together, that's your prison population. So when we look at these dynamics, our role is to unpack what's going on and to find ways to better the situation. I am not an abolitionist, but I do believe in decarceration. I believe that there are alternatives to prison that can work for many people in society and that will make it better for correctional officers as well. Um, so I think in all that context, I think our role is really to unpack this stuff. Research is necessary. It's essential in order to make change. And we need all different kinds of research from all different perspectives. I'm not an abolitionist, but I appreciate and value the people doing work in abolition because we need all of those perceptions. And if we can all intersect and find something that kind of makes sense for everyone, we're going to be able to make a lot of positive change. I'll add to that, that um, it's our responsibility to, to start telling a better, uh, telling a more comprehensive narrative, right, mm -hmm. as researchers. The fact is that I was a good CO, right? I sung in the morning, good morning, it's breakfast, it's a whole song, I'm not going to sing it now, but I sung in the morning to wake them up at five o'clock to eat breakfast chow, right? That narrative exists. I am not a unicorn in that space. There are people that are working and finding ways to bring light into what we have marked as a dark space. And out and that 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 shadow that we have placed over corrections is why no one wants to work there. <laughs> it's why no one wants to keep working there. And it's why it's hard to, to do this work, right? To teach these classes. And, and so it's our it's our job, research our job to show a more comprehensive narrative. Right? And it also will lead to changing, right? The culture and our understanding of the way corrections work. Because there are people that go to jail and never come back. There are. There are people that do that. There are people that have interacted with a correctional officer whose life has been changed because that person treated them with respect. That happens. Probation officers change lives every day, but that narrative does not show up in the research as much as it should. And that's a problem. It's a good question. It is. And I'll throw one more in there. I think one of the things that I think criminology has begun to do this, but I'm not sure it's traditionally do, done this. And I think what we really need to do is center the person and center people at this in the middle of the this research and dialogues. So instead of just saying inmates do this and guards do this and never the twain shall meet, let, that that's that's not a helpful dialogue and it doesn't move forward the understanding and it really doesn't work deal with all these big problems that we're all talking about. And I think one of the crucial things that I didn't mention in my presentation is that. Prisoners will talk about feeling vulnerable in very similar ways to, to prison officers and that they're both vulnerability is this structuring thing throughout the prison. So let's stop looking at looking at the two sides as never meeting and let's start talking about these factors that shape the jail in real ways. And I think that's one place where if we can start centering people at the center of all of these narratives, we'll do good work in starting to um, move the discussion forward and move towards a better system as we uh, continue to move towards decarceration, hopefully someday in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. And you know what, I'm going to take advantage of my chair status at the moment and, and end it there because I think it's a great place to end that conversation um, and having a contribution from all of you to that to that question. So thank you to our presenters and thank you to all of you out there for sticking with us today. This does conclude day one of our conference, um, and we really do hope that you will rejoin us again tomorrow at 8 a.m., which is, of course, Mountain Standard Time, and that panel will be entitled Lessons on Control. So either good day or good night, wherever you